Thank you. I'm going to wait just one minute so everybody can get into the class. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another week of the second wave of the pandemic, science and society. Uh, today, we're going to be continuing to talk about all things pandemic. Um, okay, and so let's see. Today, we will be talking about the Anthropocene and the pandemic. So let's start with the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is a geological time period during which human activity has sufficiently changed the earth to produce a stratigraphic signature in sediments and ice that are distinct from the Holocene. In other words, when future scientists um, and explorers look back through the earth's surface um, and try and delineate different time periods, it will be noticeable that we inhabited this particular time period of the Anthropocene. And unfortunately, the way that that will be marked is by some, some pretty depressing things. Um, so the Anthropocene is characterized by an in increase in greenhouse gas emissions, also an increase in soil erosion, an increase in pesticides, chemicals, and toxins. All of these are things that you can measure within uh, soil, ice, and so forth. And also um, increased extinction rates. We are currently in the sixth mass extinction. And in fact, uh, since the 1970s, um, which is before I was born, so definitely before any of you were born. So within our lifetimes, we have seen uh, a 68% decline in vertebrate species. Um, and that number is coming out of the, the World Wildlife Fund Living Planet report from last year, but a lot of other publications have similar numbers where across the board we're seeing these large declines uh, in species. So the connection between the Anthropocene and pandemics um, relates to how humans are interacting with the natural world. And so we see, for example, this increase in habitat loss at the hands of humans, and correspondingly also a change in the climate. These things are related to our food production, which is also associated with biodiversity loss and is um, connected to wildlife trade. And in fact, all of these things are related to each other with Habitat loss being the product of food production, wildlife trade also being connected with um, our food production, those things being associated with biodiversity loss, biodiversity loss leading to both local and global climate change and vice versa. And all of these issues impact each other. And importantly, they all contribute to the increase in disease outbreaks that we see today. So we are going to be talking about um, the Anthropocene, in other words, the way we're influencing all of these different aspects of life on Earth, and what that means in terms of increases in pandemics, and in particular, um, the, the current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Wildlife trade includes, uh, there was a question about wildlife trade. So wildlife trade includes um, trading live animals as, as pets, but also um, having wild animals incorporated into market systems, whether they're alive or not. So um, that includes things like furs, pelts, uh, bones, 
different parts of animals that are sold um, in global markets, as well as selling wild animals as food. Um, and then of course, as I started with wild animals, uh, living wild animals that are used as pets, they're used in the entertainment industry. Um, there's a lot of different aspects of, of wildlife trade. And all of these things we're gonna talk through over the semester. You may have noticed that there are several days on the syllabus that will be about um, the Anthropocene and the pandemic. Today, we're gonna focus largely on food production, but of course, all of these things are intertwined as you can see in this um, framework that's on the screen. And so we'll be touching a little bit on all of these every time we talk about the Anthropocene and the pandemic. Today's focus will just be a little bit more on food production. Okay. So we know that uh, pandemics are, are increasing. This is a picture that was made during the Zika virus outbreak a few years ago. Um, so it's, you know, this image of um, the virus in South America. Sorry, okay. So pandemics are increasing in frequency. And in fact, this concern over the increase in pandemics has been a topic that scientists have been talking about for several years, really several decades now. Um, and researchers have been warning about the need for us to start paying attention to how we're interacting with the natural world because we are causing this increase in pandemics. So for example, a couple years ago, we had Zika virus make its way to the Americas. It was a mutated form of Zika virus, which um, some of you may have heard was associated with more serious neurological consequences. Zika virus um, is similar to dengue um, and yellow fever virus. Uh, but it had previously not been found in the Americas. It used to, uh, for many decades, was known to be in Africa and Asia, um, but not associated with the neurological issues that have been seen in the Americas related to this, the mutated strain that we have here. Um, and, you know, even before that, we saw these articles coming out about the importance of thinking about the next pandemic. So in 2015, there was this editorial in the International Journal of Infectious Diseases called Planning for the Next Global Pandemic. The year before that, in 2014, um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, there was economic optimization of a global strategy to address the pandemic threat. A few years before that, in The Lancet, there was prediction and prevention of the next pandemic zoonoses. And, you know, these are just a sampling of the many articles that scientists were writing about how we need to be concerned um, about this increasing number of pandemics and how we can trace that to the way we're interacting with the natural world. So I want to remind you, we talked before about emerging infectious diseases and zoonotic diseases, but I want to remind you that those zoonotic diseases are diseases that can be transmitted between humans and other animals. Um, and that happens, as we'll talk about today, when there are close interactions between humans and other animals. So here I have a picture of um, this you know, baboon that stole a bunch of bananas out of my house in Uganda um, and then sat and ate them. Obviously, baboons coming into my house is not something that I want for many reasons. But in addition to the fact that it is a potential source of zoonotic disease transmission. Zoonotic diseases are the majority of emerging infectious diseases. And so when we talk about this increase in emerging infectious diseases, this increased threat of pandemics, we are also very much talking about where these diseases are coming from, which is other animals, and how they have the opportunity to cross from those animals into us. This is just a, a graph showing um, the increase in, in emerging infectious diseases since the 1980s. So you'll see that there's been this sharp increase in the number of emerging infectious diseases each decade. In addition to that, the, the color coding is, is indicating 
how many of these are zoonotic in origin. So um, the, the lighter pink color is showing that the majority of these are zoonotic. So when we think about this dynamic between all the ways that we are interacting with the natural world and the things we are doing to it, we can start to pull out some specific examples of how our actions are influencing the rate of emerging infectious diseases and the likelihood of another pandemic. There is uh, an increase in close contact between humans and other animals associated with basically all of the, the different branches of this diagram that I have up. So when we destroy habitats, um, when we deal in wildlife trade, uh, when we change the climate, there presents this opportunity for close contact between humans and other animals. That then increases the potential for zoonotic disease transmission. And I'll walk through some of these examples. So for example, uh, wildlife trade in hunting, prior to COVID-19, we knew that the SARS-CoV-1 outbreak was associated with wildlife trade, particularly um, with wildlife markets that, um, that include a bunch of different types of wildlife being kept together in cages. So you would have maybe heard of wet markets and how wet markets should be cut down, uh, sorry, shut down. Um, but as I, as I talked about in the last class, some of you may recall um, that you know a wet market really is something akin to our, our farmer's market here. What you need to be concerned about are wildlife markets where wildlife is being sold um, and potentially in many of, of these wildlife markets where it's not being regulated very carefully. So the, the issue is not trying to shut down quote unquote wet markets, um, which are actually a very important source of food for many people. Instead, it's about being more careful about regulating the sale of wildlife. In addition to uh, the SARS viruses, there's also um, HIV and AIDS, which we believe was transmitted between non-human primates and humans during hunting, in which uh, non-human primates were being hunted and in their butchering, then there became this potential for zoonotic disease transmission. There are two, um, two transmission events uh, between two different types of non-human primate species that we have um, for HIV and AIDS. But you know, it's not just about wildlife. Our agricultural systems and livestock production are also associated with emerging infectious diseases, including new strains or more severe illness um, from certain types of diseases. So for example, measles, tuberculosis, and influenza are all the product of our agricultural practices and livestock production. So we, we need to be thinking about how we interact with other species and with the environment overall, not only how we're interacting with wildlife. So when we think about our, our food production, um, and I'm saying our food production in terms of largely what the United States uses to mass produce food, we see that we rely increasingly on large farms that have an increased potential for zoonotic diseases. One of the reasons that there is an increase for these farms to produce zoonotic diseases is that in a natural setting, animals, humans included, have a very diverse uh, microbiome. And so you may have heard people talking about how, you know, having good gut microbes helps you uh, to stay healthy, it prevents chronic diseases, these sorts of things. The, the healthy microbiome in your gut and elsewhere in your body is really important for helping um, protect your body against all sorts of illness. And this is true not only for humans, but for all species. So what we see is that healthy wild animals have diverse microbiomes and those diverse microbiomes often shield them then from potential pathogens. Because they have like a, a, a diverse and let's say lush uh, microbiome, when, uh, when another pathogen is introduced, they often have the ability to withstand that pathogen. 
it, that's the same in, in humans. Um, and we can see that in a lot of the health literature. However, what we get in the farms that we have, for example, here in the United States, is, it a, is an attempt to try and sterilize the environment. So the species that we raise there no longer have the natural environment that they're normally exposed to. That also is associated with a less diverse microbiome. And then they become more susceptible to new pathogens. Now, if you have a high concentration of a, a bunch of individuals together, you already have an increased chance of transmission, right? Being in, in close association, the way we often keep animals in factory farms, uh, that already is problematic for, for disease transmission. If you add on top of that, the fact that the immune system of these animals is not very good, partially due to the fact that they do not have a diverse microbiome, you suddenly have a situation in which you have animals that are very susceptible to disease. That disease can then also pass into the humans that they're interacting closely with. And to layer even more of a problem on top of that, um, a lot of ways that we deal with this in the, these large farms is to give them antibiotics to try and prevent um, any illness that antibiotics could treat. But we now know that actually that has led to a lot of, um, uh, sorry, that should say antibiotic resistant bacteria, not disease resistant bacteria, um, but antibiotic resistant bacteria which then also passes in into humans. And so our environment, our, our um, domesticated animals and us as people have a threat from the types of pathogens that can come out of these large farms. In addition to that, we have issues with climate change, which increases the range of vector-borne diseases. So vector-borne, remember we've talked about this before, is referring to uh, diseases that require an intermediary to transfer the disease between individuals. Those are things like mosquitoes, fleas, ticks. So this is an image um, from a recent article um, by Sadie Ryan uh, in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. This is one of the figures where it's showing for these two species of mosquitoes. So there's two species of mosquitoes you can see here on the, the right side. For those two species of mosquitoes, it's showing their range currently. Um, and what the coloration is indicating is whether those mosquitoes live at these different ranges uh, for a given number of months each year. So for example, if it's red, that means that they live there for all 12 months of the year. If it's blue, dark blue, that means that they maybe live there for one month out of the year, or if white, if they don't live there at all. So basically, based on the climate, how many months of the year can these mosquitoes live in these different areas? Now, these mosquitoes are important because um, they are the carriers of Zika virus. They're also the carriers of dengue um, and chikungunya. So there's several diseases, viruses, that these mosquitoes spread that are naturally limited in their spread based on where the mosquitoes live year round. And again, you see that going through the middle, close to the equator, the warmer parts of the globe are the places where these mosquitoes are living for 12 months out of the year. And then the further south or the further north that you get from the equator, the fewer months of the year they are able to live there. Now, obviously, if you're thinking about this in terms of climate change, the fact that we are changing our climate such that it is remaining warm for longer periods of time at these uh, areas further from the equator means that these mosquitoes will be able to live in those areas for longer, therefore able to spread these viruses that we often think of as you know, tropical viruses, as viruses that you really only have to worry about when you're in these certain latitudes. So we have wildlife trade and hunting impacting our, our interactions with animals and zoonotic disease transmission. 
agriculture and livestock production, and also climate change. In addition to that, biodiversity loss actually impacts the likelihood that there will be zoonotic disease transmission. And I wanna walk you through this because it's not immediate, immediately obvious to everyone. So um, large mammals decline faster than smaller species like bats and rodents. So when we see biodiversity loss, this is not happening the same for every species. We have bigger species that are being lost at a faster rate than smaller species. And then these smaller species can actually move into other areas. So for example, if you have a, a habitat loss that leads to the loss of large mammals and, re, and leaves behind bats and rodents, let's say, even though that habitat has been lost, those animals can then move into other areas. Likely the other areas are going to be places where people live. And then you have that increase in zoonotic disease transmission. Why is it likely that the, the other places they move into is gonna be where people live? Because the whole point of the habitat being destroyed is that people are doing it, right? So there's fewer and fewer spaces for these um, species to live in the wild and instead they'll be closer to humans. We currently have a rate of extinction that is 100 to 1,000 times what background extinction rates are. And future extinction rates, um, so over the next 50 years, over your lifetime, uh, they are estimated to be 10 to 100 times more than our present extinction rates. So we're talking about very fast extinction rates. Um, and, you know, I think this is important to recognize because Many people try to say like, you say it's the sixth mass, ex mass extinction, extinction is normal, we've seen it happen, you know, so many times over the history of the earth and so forth. And while that is true, it is not normal for one particular species, that species being humans, to lead to the extinction of so many other species. And at such a fast rate, I mean, yes, we have seen mass extinctions in the past, like for example, when the earth has been hit by meteors from outer space. Um, but in terms of a species that is currently living on the planet causing this sort of mass extinction, that is not normal. And when people tell you it's normal, it's not. Um, and part of the problem is that we are changing the environment so rapidly that the normal process of evolution that would allow other species to adapt to those changes simply can't happen in that fast of a time. So a, a great example of this right here from the US, because I think too often we think of these as being issues that happen somewhere else um, and, and that you know, we, we don't have to deal with here in the US. Tick-borne diseases are, are something that the US um, is kind of known for, uh, at least in my sphere. I've had you know, scientists from other countries come to the United States and end up getting exposed to tick-borne diseases that they don't have in their home countries. And so they go back to their home countries and their doctors don't know how to treat it. Much like my experience getting malaria, for example, in another place and then coming back to the United States and doctors here really not having very much experience with that. Um, so tick-borne diseases are, are an, an example that we can look at to try and understand how differences in biodiversity can impact our exposure to zoonotic diseases. So here, for example, uh, this is from uh, that publication that I, I referenced um, on the previous slide um, from Nature in 2010. They're looking at ticks and Lyme disease and the, the impact of, for example, possums being um, uh, a species that the ticks target versus a mouse. So in this scenario, the mouse is the small, uh, you know, one of the rodents that can move into a different area that doesn't necessarily go extinct in the face of, of habitat loss or climate change um, or other human disturbances to the habitat. And then in this example, the possum is the larger mammal um, that, that may not be as adaptable. I mean, in this case, possums are actually way more adaptable than let's say an elephant, but still not as adaptable as, as the mouse. Um, and yet possums are actually really great. I, I, I have a personal 
thing against possums, which is terrible because I know how good they are when it comes to diseases um, because uh, they actually get rid of a huge portion of our tick population that could potentially spread illness. Um, so here you'll see on the left, you have um, the mouse that, that feeds uh, on ticks and then on the right, the possum feeding on ticks. And you can see here with these, um, the green here, it's just uh, almost all of the ticks that the, the possum is feeding on does not infer an infection. Whereas just a tiny, tiny amount have this issue of infection. Whereas for the mouse, it's the opposite. You see a lot of um, infection happening with the mice feeding on these ticks. So the possums actually do this great service in our environment, which is indicated by this big circle here, that they, they groom off and kill a ton of ticks every year. And in doing so then, they reduce the chances of zoonotic transmission of uh, diseases from ticks to every other species, including humans. Okay, so when we lose biodiversity, we also increase the chances of getting um, zoonotic diseases. I wanna give you also an example of the impact of habitat loss, and this will kind of pull together some of these different issues, particularly related to food production. Um, so I wanna talk about Nipah virus. I think that uh, a lot of people are not necessarily familiar with Nipah virus, it's another, um, emerging infectious disease that we've dealt with in the past several years. Um, so let's talk about how this looks. So we now know that the reason that we have gotten to experience Nipah virus um, is because there was this habitat loss, particularly with people transforming um, forests into palm oil plantations. Um, so they, they uh, destroyed a bunch of natural forest and instead replaced it with palm oil plantations. And these bats that were, yes, our good friends, the bats, these bats that were living in that forest then ended up moving along uh, the edges of farmland and plantations and roosting in fruit trees that existed um, in this area. And so, you know, they could feed on on fruits uh, of the trees that were being planted. So as they ate that food and they were eating the food, hanging in these areas that were close to humans and also to human farms, they ended up dropping some of the food they were eating, but also their urine and you know excrement into the farm area where pigs were kept. Okay, so those pigs then ate food that they had dropped, ate things that were contaminated with the excrement of the bats. Um, and also people ate some of the fruit from the area where bats were feeding. And then also the people slaughtered the pigs so that they, they could eat them. That was the reason the pigs were being farmed. Um, and as a result, we have Nipah virus. So this is very much a connection between habitat loss, food production, and the exposure to a new disease of zoonotic origin. Um, and some of you have been asking like, how exactly do we get exposed to these diseases? There are many ways. I'll go through some other, um, I'll, I'll go through some other um, examples, but you know, this is just one way in which destroying that habitat, changing the way we're interacting with the land, the, the close proximity that we're putting ourselves, but also other species um, into contact, that increases uh, this, the, the rate of zoonotic disease transmission. Um, I see someone asking, wasn't the Nipah virus infection scheme recapitulated in the movie Contagion? And yes, I believe that was the name of the movie, but yeah, there's a movie with, um, Matt Damon and Gwyneth Paltrow, that is basically contagion, uh, sorry, that is basically this Nipah virus situation. And I mean, I think also 
you know, to, to all the people who said this could have never been predicted, not only were scientists predicting it, but scientists were predicting it so much and so uh, loudly that, that I think there have been multiple movies. There have also been books that kind of play out these different, um, you know, there are books about respiratory viruses that have been spread around the world and um, things like that. So yeah, this is definitely something people, people talk about for sure. So some people were asking, uh, sorry. Yeah, so I think some people were asking about how then from the pigs having it, does it get to the people? But again, this is part of um, the, those interactions of you know actually slaughtering the animal is how they think then that the disease got from pigs to people. Okay, so all of these connecting parts really make the One Health approach important. So One Health, um, as I've mentioned before, is where you look at the intersection between human health, environmental health, and other animal health. So you're saying that in order for us as humans to be healthy, we have to make sure that our environment is healthy and that other animals are healthy. Um, this includes things like having safe air and water um, and also thinking about having stable, healthy wildlife populations, um, having food safety, st sustainable food available to us. Uh, and so there has been an increased um, emphasis on studying human health from the One Health approach. And that really means that we need to be investing money not only in the research that's getting done at hospitals and in human populations, but also the research that's being done on monitoring the environment. There's some great work that's happening um, on monitoring the environment for different pathogens that exist in the environment. It means that we have to put effort into monitoring other animal populations and seeing what pathogens exist in them. We are making ourselves sick. Uh, sorry, we're making our world sick and therefore we're making ourselves sick. So if our planet is unhealthy, we cannot be healthy. And I think this is something we really need to emphasize and make sure that people understand because I think that it has been very common and continues to be very common for people to kind of say like, yeah, okay, we're polluting the heck out of the environment, but who cares, <laughs> you know? and. And if for no other reason to care, it's because we cannot be healthy as long as we are doing that. So uh, what can we do? I think one thing that's very important for all of us to do is recognize our role as consumers. Um, and in this class at different points, we'll talk through some of, some of the ways we can do that. Wildlife trade is a global economic driver of these issues. Um, and you know, it, it, that's just one place in which we play a role as consumers, you may be thinking like, I don't trade in wildlife. And that is probably true, but I bet that every one of us in this room has at some point um, in, you know, watched something in entertainment that has involved wildlife trade. Because uh, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it seems like a lot of people in the United States watched Tiger King last year, which I did not watch. But even aside from that, you know, just the sitcoms that have monkeys in them, the movies that have apes in them and things like that, it's very common. So we need to make sure that that trade is regulated and that the products that are being traded are tested for pathogens. And, you know, many people would really advocate for very strong regulations um, and, and also, you know, just some things that aren't allowed to be traded at all. Uh, we also need to think about our, how global consumption of certain products is driving these issues. So too often we put the burden of what's happening with zoonotic disease transmission on people who are living most closely to the wildlife that is potentially transmitting diseases to us. But in fact, the reason why they're put in close contact to, to those species is really about global consumption. So let's talk about some of that. Um, so oil, gold, silver, coltan, which is the conducting agent in your cell phone, your computers, all of those things, 
all of those are things that most people at some point um, either have or have purchased. And those all contribute to habitat destruction. They contribute to contaminating the environment with toxins. Um, they, they contribute to the death of uh, endangered species. Um, and they also are associated with really horrible human rights violations. So, you know, these are just an ex four examples of really common products that are used at a global scale. And when we purchase them, we actually are having an impact on what's happening at a local level in different places, particularly in the tropics. Similarly, there are a lot of agricultural products, um, like just keeping livestock takes a lot of land. Um, and, and also, you know, pollutes the environment causes habitat destruction. A lot of the, the Amazon has been cut down related both to keeping livestock, but also um, to the production of livestock feed like soy. Um, and so, you know, that soy not only is used in South America to feed livestock, that soy is, is exported to places like the United States and we use that to feed our livestock. So we are part of this global consumption pattern that's having a horrible effect on the world and also on our own health via zoonotic disease transmission. I see someone saying, um, reminds me of the coal tan mining crisis in DRC. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, uh, people who are old enough may remember that there was, there were horrible human rights violations in the DRC um, in relation to, to mining coal tan. Um, and, you know, I think so many people in this world own a cell phone, own a computer, own all sorts of electronic devices and don't know anything about the fact that the conducting agent in all of those things is just doing horrible things to the world. So it's good for us to um, inform ourselves and, and think about our what we're consuming and, and what we're purchasing. Um, yes, okay. Uh, I, many of you, I'm sure, also have heard about palm oil production and, and how that has just devastated um, particularly areas of Asia, um, especially places where orangutans live. They've been cut down and replaced with palm oil plantations. So it's really good to keep track. You know, palm oil is not just in food, it's in um, hair products, it's in lotions, it's in all sorts of things. So it's good to keep track of what you're buying and what's actually in it. Plastics. Plastics are just horrible for the environment all around. Um, and they're bad for our health. They're, you know, they contain a bunch of toxins. They require oil to make. They pollute the earth. Microplastics are in everything basically at this point. Um, so, you know, just being aware of these issues and making changes that can reduce your impact on the globe by cutting out some of these and influence these, influencing these global consumption patterns can really make a difference. So again, we have this land conversion in tropical countries for global consumption. And a lot of the emphasis gets focused on what people in those tropical countries are doing and how they need to change. And really the driver behind all of this is not people there. It's, it's people like those of us in the United States who are driving, driving these consumption patterns. Also, human-driven climate change is impacting these patterns, um, as I already mentioned to you, uh, you know, we have, th this is kind of a cascading effect, right? As you um, destroy habitats, you alter the climate, that altered climate then also impacts the, the survival um, and health of the existing habitat and species. So it's, it's really just, um, it all builds on each other and creates for a very unhealthy world. And I think it's important for us to keep in mind that um, we should try in ways that we can to help with individual government and corporate efforts to reduce human impacts on the climate. That will have an effect on future pandemics and on our health overall. As I mentioned also, it's not just about looking for these illnesses in humans, but we need to have ongoing surveillance for illness in wild animals. This is obviously part of what I do, but um, as, as I'll mention in some of the later slides, this really 
has an impact on our ability to um, deal with, with new outbreaks when they occur. So we know that COVID-19 can infect other species. I mean, aside from the fact that we know we got it from another species, now the problem is humans are the ones circulating it, right? We're the ones spreading it all over. And so we need to think about what, what we're doing to possibly expose other species. Um, there have been genetic studies that show that many other primates, so a lot of non-human primates, can get COVID-19. Keep in mind that the majority of those species are endangered. So we now have a virus circulating among humans at a pretty high rate that could be very detrimental to um, endangered non-human primate species. And in fact, not only hypothetically do we know that they can get infected, but in fact, they have been infected. At the San Diego Zoo, um, gorillas became infected. This happened maybe a month or two ago. Um, and, and despite the zoo following careful protocols, the gorillas ended up getting infected and showing some uh, respiratory symptoms, although I believe they have fully recovered. So we have a real danger now of exposing wildlife. This is something that's a big topic of conversation in my circles because obviously, you know, I normally spend my time in other places studying non-human primates and I have, it's now been a year since I last traveled for my research and I am very eager to go back to those places and continue my research. Um, but, you know, there's a real danger of what I could bring with me. In addition to the fact that even the, the local researchers that I work with are all staying home because we know that we could potentially um, expose endangered species to this, this virus. So, you know, we know that not only can humans spread diseases um, to other animals, but also even without humans being involved, the zoonotic disease transmission can be really detrimental to other species, especially endangered species. Um, so there is a question about is COVID as fatal to other endangered species as it is to humans or is it worse? We don't, we don't know that yet. Um, so I mean, fortunately, I guess we haven't had a lot of um, data to, to test this because right now people are trying to be very careful about not exposing other species. Um, and keep in mind that actually, ex well, I'll get to it in a few slides, but exposing other species that the virus can then mutate in is actually terrible for human health as well. So unfortunately, or fortunately, we don't have an answer to that yet. Okay, so, uh, you know, Ebola is a, another recent emerging infectious disease that's had uh, pretty serious impacts on our globe. And there are gorilla populations that have been really um, horribly impacted by Ebola, killing off, you know, many individuals. Um, and so we know that there is disease transmission between different species. There's also a lot of evidence from looking at domesticated animals and wildlife in which when you have farms where domesticated animals and wildlife live in close proximity. Um, you can see that a lot of the pathogens that exist in the domesticated animals suddenly end up in the wild populations. So this zoonotic disease transmission goes in all directions and all of it's bad for us. So you have this issue with spillover, right? So you can have a species that has a pathogen and then it spills over into humans, let's say, um, but then you can also have spillback and that's what we're talking about here. So you have that pathogen spillover and from the research that's been done, it shows that that is most strongly associated with um, agricultural uh, work that we do. So, you know, the way that we deforest land and have these massive farms that is closely associated with spillover events. But then you can also have spillback events after the disease has evolved. That's, that's a big problem too, right? So basically every, within every species where this pathogen exists, it has the ability to mutate and become something different. And then you can keep passing these different strains back and forth between, um, between for example, humans 
and other species. So we have to be really careful um, to not make the situation worse than it already is. Next lecture, I'm gonna be talking about evolution and mutation, specifically as it relates to the different strains that have evolved in humans. But the added complication to that is that we could actually create a situation in which um, you know, other species are also reservoirs of the illness and they can then pass it back to us, maybe even in a mutated form. That's, you know, the, the idea of wild reservoirs of these diseases that impact humans is, um, is a lot of what I study and, and am interested in. Okay, so um, for example, here we have, um, my screen. Okay, so here we have uh, an example from a recent um, letter to the editor from Tom Gillespie and colleagues, where they were showing that some of these places where there was recent zoonotic disease emergence, um, so like here in South America and Africa and Asia, you have these recent uh, zoonotic disease transmission events that then caused human disease. Um, and notably, their point in this letter is that actually the places that are the most biodiverse and are facing the greatest threats from human-induced um, habitat changes, so human you know, deforestation and other human activities that are, that are causing degradation to the habitat, those are the areas that are most likely to be places where we see these novel pathogens emerging. So you've got places that have high rates of biodiversity. That means they also have a lot of different pathogens. And then when humans start to um, uh, degrade the habitat, increase the potential for humans um, and non-human animals to be in close contact, then you get the greatest likelihood of this pathogen spillover. And so really, we need to be thinking about all of this interconnected. Um, we need integrated policies where we're not just thinking about health policies, environment policies, climate policies, economic policies. But if COVID-19 has shown us anything, I hope that it has shown us that these are all very much connected and we need these integrated policies. Um, you know, people have, uh, have pointed out many times that our environment has suffered because our economic policies don't incorporate the real costs. So what I mean by that is that there are tons of um, services that the environment does for us, like providing clean water, um, clean air, uh, you know, rainfall, the, those sorts of things that are important, they're ecosystem services, right? When we do things, when a company does something that interferes with those ecosystem services, usually the company does not pay for that. That's not included in the cost that the company has to pay to be able to do whatever it is it wants to do. So in other words, what the world loses, what local people lose, what the environment loses, what our overall health as a planet loses, costs much more than what a company actually pays um, because economic policies don't incorporate these very real costs. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard about um, how, sorry about that, my dog might start barking in a second. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard about how, um, in places where bees have not been able to survive, people have to, to actually pollinate plants by hand. That's a very expensive endeavor to do the pollinating work of bees, but it happens because uh, environments have been degraded to the point that bees cannot survive. And then um, people have to find a way around that. Well, that economic cost, it turns out, is much more than whatever they originally factored in for, you know, creating these like uh, monocultures that bees can't survive in, for example. So I would just ask you, you know, what has the economic cost of COVID-19 been? I think that if we factor in chances of pandemics 
into the economic framework of what we expect companies that are polluting our environment, destroying wild habitats, um, moving around endangered species, if we incorporated those into what they were paying, it, things would be very different. We would not see the mass disruption to the environment that we see right now. So from that uh, article that I just showed you the figure from, um, Tom Gillespie and colleagues say, a recent cost benefit analysis of pandemic prevention found that reducing deforestation by half would be a cost effective way to substantially reduce spillover risks. With an ancillary benefit of close to four billion per year in reduced greenhouse gas emissions. So these are the, th the sorts of actual costs, you know, thinking about what has it cost us to deal with this pandemic monetarily? What does it cost us in terms of greenhouse gas emissions to have this polluted air and whatnot, um, and the associated health effects of that? If we actually try and incorporate these different issues together and have an integrated policy where we incorporate you know, the effects on our health, the effects on the environment into our economic policies, uh, then we, we would be in a much better place. We must address the demand and incentive structures for the production and trade of commodities that harm the environment. So things like palm oil, soy, beef. I mean, palm oil, soy, and beef, those are three of the top agricultural products that result in the loss, conversion, and degradation of native forests. Um, and, and so if we try and have these integrative policies that, that incorporate demand and incentive structures, uh, you know, th things would look very different than what we currently have, um, which allows very low cost for companies, relatively low cost uh, for companies to be able to destroy the environment to pursue these sorts of business ventures. And then those, uh, that work should be combined with risk assessments that incorporate the potential of spillover and other health costs. So again, just needing to integrate all of this information. If we combine health, environmental, and economic policy, both locally and globally, overall, our concern about future pandemics would be greatly reduced because the whole drive would not be about um, economics without incorporating these other factors. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, spillover is uh, when you're, when it's being passed between species, right? So the spillover event um, these spillover events could be when we're exposing a certain uh, certain area, like in Nipah virus, you know, that habitat loss that pushed bats um, to the edge of plantations, and then you had this spillover event of Nipah virus into humans. Okay, so in addition to, to needing these integrated policies when we think about economics, I also really want to emphasize how important it is to think about local people, a lot of, of well-intentioned, smart individuals want to do development work. Um, they want to do outreach work and conservation work. And so often that sort of work um, is actually to the detriment of local people because too often it assumes that whoever the you know, people are coming in, they know best and rarely it is done in a collaborative fashion and rarely it is, is done in a way that appreciates the very important knowledge and skills of local people. Um, I'm, I do uh, participatory action research, um, which is community-based research where I collaborate with local communities to do research to deal with the, the development um, and conservation issues that are of concern to them. And so I think that in all of this that we're talking about, you know, you might be feeling very inspired to go change the world, which would be great. Please go change the world. That would be wonderful. I just want to emphasize that um, in every aspect of this, there's going to be a lot of push for people trying to make a difference at the local level, right? In the places where, where these zoonotic disease transmission events are happening. 
we need to be doing that in a sustainable way. So sustainable development must account for pandemic risk. I think we need to be thinking about that. But not only should develop, sustainable development account for pandemic risk, I think even more than that, we also need to be working with local communities and um, you know, together coming up with strategies rather than uh, you know, imparting whatever we think is best, because that basically never works, to be honest. OK. So um, another thing that's important not only is sampling wild populations to see what pathogens exist in them, but also looking at what's going on in the environment. So if you look at how landscapes are changing, if you can see where deforestation is happening, how it's being replaced, um, and then compare those modified landscapes to wildlife, I think that opens up the possibility to look at um, different zoonotic disease um, transmission opportunities. Um, and so you can get at those opportunities for exchange and have a better, um, more directed approach to dealing with potentially future pandemics. Um, and also, I think one of the greatest things we could do to reduce future pandemic risks is keep more tropical forest in place. Uh, and that would not only help prevent future pandemics, but it would also reduce the risk of climate change. So this would, you know, do two things that really need to ha happen urgently. Um, so conservation definitely helps reduce the risk of future pandemics um, and, and hopefully other things associated with health issues. But as I already said, I think that uh, we need to be thinking about sustainable alternatives, both for ourselves but also for local communities and working with local communities to, to create positive opportunities for them because too often they are, they are put in a very precarious situation in this whole um, system, even though it's really the global economy that's driving the issues that we see. I think that to prevent or reduce the rates of future pandemics, we must significantly improve our protection of the natural environment. I think that that alone will be a major um, influencer of the future pandemics that we see. So some of the individual action that you can do, and there's lots of different individual actions that you can do um, that I've kind of touched on throughout this, but we're, again, we're gonna have other lectures about this. So this really focuses on, on food related ones. So, you know, be thinking about your link to food, where you're getting your food from, how it's, how it's processed, what went into creating the space for that food to be made. Um, you know, if you ever have a point in your life where you're able to, you can grow some of your own food. You can also keep pollinator friendly plants. That's, that's becoming increasingly important with all of the stressors on bees and other pollinators. Try and be aware of food waste. Um, food waste, you know, just adds to the need for more and more food produced, even though it's not really being used. When you have the opportunity, you can do some composting and little things like planning out your meals. I mean, this stuff probably sounds very basic to you. Um, and it is, but these little things add up um, and, then, and then you can you know, also spend all your energy doing bigger things as well. Um, you can buy reduced, produ uh, reduced produce, so kind of like the not perfect produce that exists in the grocery store. There are delivery services that do this also so that you can get like a monthly or weekly subscription to a delivery service that brings you the not best produce that exists so it doesn't get wasted. And overall, you just want to think about reducing your consumption of all products. You know, when you replace um, some disposable products with something more sustainable, the idea isn't just to get as much of that <laughs> sustainable product as, as possible, but instead just like have what you need and use what you need. Um, when you can, try and choose sustainable products. And, you know, I think overall, as I've been talking about working with local communities, I think that at a bigger level, incorporating indigenous communities into conservation and or development planning is, is really important. And in doing that, we will help with uh, not only all of the important problems with the environment, but our exposure to uh, other zoonotic diseases. And just be aware of the impact the products that you purchase or use 
have on the natural environment? Okay, so there are quite a few questions. I'm going to try and get through some of them. And then I have a few additional um, comments at the end of this. So let's see. A lot of questions are uh, related to, um, uh, you know, changes in climate and also like the species that that are impacting um, our exposure to diseases. Um, okay, so let's see. Right, so so there are, are questions about how we have these transmission events between um, humans and other species or other species to humans. And, you know, I think one thing hopefully that you got from this talk is that those transmission events vary a lot. So, um, you know, for example, there was an outbreak of Ebola virus that was traced back likely to a kid that was playing like in a tree where bats were sleeping. Um, and the, then that the kid got um, Ebola, brought it back to his community. Um, and so uh, there, there's the transmission events like that. Similarly, Marburg, which is another hemorrhagic fever, it's similar to Ebola. People have gotten Marburg before when they've been like tourists going into caves. Um, you know, usually not these, these big well-known caves, but uh, in some places when people have gone into caves, come into contact with uh, the droppings of bats. Um, they've got Marburg. I mentioned HIV and hunting primates. Um, the fleas, uh, as I, I was talking about tick-borne uh, diseases, fleas are another vector. Um, the plague was, was the result of fleas that were biting mice, and rats, and then biting people. Um, some people were asking about, about you know, studying rodents to look for the next disease outbreak. A lot of people are studying rodents to look for this because there are definitely a lot of pathogens that, that um, rodents carry that then can pass over into humans. Um, okay, how do climate change and other environmental changes affect high-risk communities inequitably? Yes, so climate change definitely disproportionately impacts some of the most vulnerable populations that we, we have on Earth. Um, but also, as I was saying, the measures to protect the environment often also disproportionately affect those people. Uh, so we're really putting the burden of a lot on local communities. Um, you know, climate change is most seriously felt along the equator and at the poles. Um, and in some of those places, you have very, uh, you have communities that are really relying on uh, a consistent climate to to, to farm, to hunt, to live, um, and climate change is impacting that a lot. Uh, what do you think is the most effective way to combat climate change that would positively impact the transmission of diseases and viruses? You know, stop massive land conversion. I think that's the, the most important thing. We need to stop destroying habitats. Um, if we stop destroying those habitats, I think that that would have benefits in many ways. Uh, so yeah, okay. It seems as if the chances of infectious diseases increase with our interactions with animals rather than the environment. How can we change how we interact with a bat? So that is, that is not the case. It is actually that um, it is directly related to our interactions with the environment. I mean, obviously all of these things are connected, but the way that we're interacting with the environment is related to um, whether we have that close interaction with a bat or not. Um, are rising temps associated with increased zoonoses? Yes, definitely. Uh, and how do you get people to think about that in the long term? You know, that's really difficult. I think trying to come at this from whatever angle people will be willing to listen to you know, what is, it, what is it that they care about? Is it their kids? Is it their money? Is it like the vacationing they do on a beach somewhere? Um, you know, trying to find something for people who really don't wanna talk about climate change and don't wanna care about climate change, I think trying to find the thing that they do care about and connect it to that is, is really important. Um, 
yeah. And then uh, let's see. So, uh, you know, someone was also saying like, given how important this all seems, why, why haven't I heard more about it? It seems like we should be hearing about this all the time. And yes, I mean, I completely agree. This is something that we need to increase how much, you know, increase the fact that we're talking about it. Um, and I think trying to, to do that, you know, can help us to kind of create these cultural changes where we're encouraging people to do something different than what they normally do, but make it accessible to them. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully make it a norm. Like that's, I think that's one of the great things that about individual action. Like we have the ability to do things that actually lead to a change that other people do also, you know? And so whatever, whatever way you can connect with people to try and get them to do that, I think it's, it's great to do. Um, yes. So is the rise of animal born pathogens inevitable and unpredictable like mutations? Or can we do something to predict and stop it? I mean, I think the best thing that we can do is uh, change the way we're interacting with the natural world. Um, you know, this monitoring the environment and other species for diseases is really important. So you may have heard of a program called PREDICT. PREDICT was a, a program where people were trying to look in different places where they thought the next outbreak would occur and record the different pathogens that other animals had. One of the places this was being done was in China. Um, prior to COVID-19, uh, the PREDICT program was stopped. Um, and you know, that work in China, so, so PREDICT is part of the, is a program through the US government. Um, and so it was, you know, people from the US doing some work in China on this and then that that stopped. Um, but, you know, hopefully we'll get back. We have a new administration now. Hopefully we'll get back to some of that monitoring work that I think is is so important. Um, let's see. Could you talk about the ways in which individual conservation and sustainability efforts are limited by larger structural, social, and economic factors? For example, how food deserts prevent many Americans from consuming sustainably sourced food? What can people of lower socioeconomic status do? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the reality is that people of lower socioeconomic status have a lot of limitations in, in, in the ways that their voices are heard overall. All the more reason that um, people who have the ability to have their voice heard should try and make it heard. But I will say that, you know, there a lot of times in the, in the criticisms of conservation, um, people say like, oh, well, you know, people that don't have all of this privilege can't do these things. In fact, you know, a lot of people of lower socioeconomic status are already doing the things that we're trying to convince wealthier people to do. So things like uh, not using plastic bags, there are many stores that are based in um, parts of cities that are have uh, like a, a lower socio socioeconomic demographic um, and they don't provide plastic bags. So people use you know, cardboard boxes, or they bring their own bags, those sorts of things. Uh, there are a lot of um, people who don't, like, they can't consume as much, I don't mean eating wise, but like, they can't buy a bunch of new cell phones and computers every time they want, because they don't have the money to do that. I mean, some of these things that we're encouraging people to do, they're already things that are happening within certain demographics. Um, and so I don't uh, like, I, I realize this question wasn't setting up this dichotomy, but I think, I think that you will see the more that you read about um, kind of environmentalism and conservation, you'll see some people pose this criticism of like, well, that's great that you want to use a cloth bag, but not everybody can aff afford a cloth bag. And that's, that's true. At the same time, like, people have been using other things besides plastic bags to transport their, their groceries home for a long time. That's just been like a way of life for, for certain stores, for example. Um, so I think also though, you know, keeping in mind that any measures that try and address these issues need to be based on thinking about all the different access that people have to things um, the, the different needs that people have. I mean, 
this, this, and that's why in the lecture, I tried to keep pointing out the fact that like, you know, this is, this is a global consumption issue. Um, and yet there are people that are very much at the forefront of this. Uh, you know, we were, we were talking about environmental racism um, in, a, in one of the previous class sessions and environmental racism, racism is very much a situation where we have poor air quality that disproportionately impacts people of color. Like they will benefit if we actually set standards that don't allow the air to be polluted in the way that it is. So hopefully it will have a positive effect, but I think that it requires um, people being very holistic in the way they think about things uh, and taking those, those issues into mind. So I appreciate you asking that because it's, it's definitely a concern. Um, okay, so we have a few minutes left. Um, there's, you know, lots of questions about how do you convince people? Uh, and, and, you know, again, just try and find something that's, that's relatable to them or that they care about. You know, there are some, even if you have to go to celebrities, there are some celebrities. When I was a kid, I really liked Leonardo DiCaprio. He is like an outspoken person for the environment now. So people in my generation, you might be able to convince them in that way. Um, I don't know if your generation watched The Big Lebowski, but they're the main character, the dude, uh, Jeff Bridges, he, he has spoken out about, about plastic use. So there are different, you know, get creative. I know I'm always telling you that, but get creative about how you, how you try and frame these issues for different people. Um, and because really, I mean, we, we need so desperately, this is a very important issue. It is unfortunate that it does not get talked about more. Um, and, and it is, it is something that we need to be really voicing and making sure that people understand that we, like this pandemic didn't just happen to us. It is something that has been building that will continue to happen. And it's very much about um, the way that we, we are interacting with the world. Since we just have um, a few more minutes to talk, I wanted to get to a question that was about last lecture, just to clarify something. Somebody asked about um, the unemployment benefits and stimulus checks and, and how they were two sides of the same scale, uh, where increases to one may neg negatively affect the other. Um, and so they were saying like they don't exactly understand how that works. I want to clarify that, that that situation where it was um, uh, the stimulus was tied to this idea that workers' rights would be in jeopardy. It was specific to the package that was being debated um, in Congress, and it was because the language that had been added to the package that would have given financial support to people included in it that, that these corporations, like for example, companies that are in the meat packing and poultry industry, that those corporations would be protected from being responsible for health impacts that happen to their employees because of the, the, um, the ways they forced them to work during the pandemic, the, the lack of space that they provided, things like that. And so you had people in Congress who understandably did not want to vote for a package that yes, it provided funding for people, which they wanted, but then on the other side, there were these people that, that would not have been protected because instead the corporations would have been protected. So that, that was a very, it is not the case that you have to choose one or the other. That was not what I was trying to say. So I just wanna clarify that. Um, instead, it's really about, uh, you know, this, this the, the specific language that was being used before, but it does not have to be that way. Hopefully we will have support for people um, that, that also allows support for, for workers' rights at the same time. Okay, so I think that we are just about out of time. I do just want to um, mention one other thing about masks. People have been asking a lot of questions about masks. And last time I mentioned, you know, make sure that you're wearing three layers. Um, you know, how you do that depends which kinds of masks you're using matters and those sorts of things. Just remember that those recommendations for wearing really good masks are particularly important when you are in a public place. So if you are indoors or in an enclosed space with people you do not live with, you really wanna be careful about your masks. 
But another way to handle that is just to reduce to whatever extent you can, which I realize there's a, there's a limit to that, but reduce to whatever extent you can um, how much time you're spending indoors with people that you don't live with. If you are in a place where other people are not wearing masks, definitely have eye covering also. So you wanna have that good mask and then either a face shield or goggles or glasses. Um, that's, that's particularly important in places where not everyone's wearing a mask. Hopefully if everyone has on a mask, that becomes less important. But it's, you know, that is, your eyes are another way that you can get infected. So be aware of that. Uh, lastly, I'll just mention that we have updated Canvas. There is a new discussion board on mental health tips and ideas for staying connected safely. Please have a look at that. We also have updated the syllabus and included some of our speakers that will be coming up over the next few weeks. Uh, so please check out that. We will also be soliciting questions for some of them in advance. So we'll let you know when that happens. Don't forget that quiz one is due and quiz two is opening this week. And also we added the description of the K through 12 project um, so please be sure to review that. A week from Wednesday, we will have a speaker that can answer questions for you about that project. So please, it's a lot of information to look over. Please be sure you look it over um, and then have some questions ready for the speaker on the 17th of February. Okay, so with that, we are at time. So I'm going to go ahead and end this. I will see you all on Wednesday. Until then, stay safe.